Good morning to you, my brothers and sisters. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad. And I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church, located on the west side of Chicago. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of this church, we are so excited to welcome you for our Sunday School Hour. Today's lesson is taking place on Easter Sunday, but I like to think of as the anniversary of the church where we celebrate not only the death, but the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know that it is through the power of his resurrection that we are all saved. And so we thank God for the sacrifice that he gave when he sent his son. We thank Jesus for the sacrifice when he was obedient to the Father and gave his life that we might be saved. We, we, we like to look at it as we were stained with sin and the blood of Christ covers us. And so now that when God sees us, he doesn't see us uh, for our faults. He doesn't see us in our shortcomings, but rather God sees us covered with the blood of Jesus, 100% good, 100% pure. And that's something that we were not able to do on our own, but only through the power of Jesus Christ, both in his death and his resurrection. We have a wonderful lesson today. It's entitled The Eternal Hope. It's taken from the 28th chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Our key verse comes from Matthew 28, verse 10, reading in the New King James Version. It reads, then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Our three goals in today's lesson is first, that we will examine Matthew's account of the resurrection. Second, we will rejoice in the liberation that comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And third, finally, we will commit to living with the courage that comes from the freedom of Jesus' resurrection. And so we're going to start with prayer and jump right into our lesson. Again, happy Easter Sunday to each and every one of you. May God's grace and peace continue to richly abound in your life. And we praise God for both your presence and your prayers this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for another opportunity to worship your name. We thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. Father, we confess that we have fallen short. But because of the power of the blood of Jesus, you don't see us in our shortcomings, but you see us as perfected creatures. So as you continue to work on us, we ask that you remove whatever does not belong, replace it with your love, with your wisdom, but also with your word. Now lift us up higher that we might see you clearer and better understand your will for our lives. It is in your darling and precious son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So following the triumphal entry in the last meal, which we covered somewhat in last week's lesson, Jesus was arrested uh, by the workings of Judas's betrayer, one of his own disciples from the 12 people that had traveled with him for the past three years sold Jesus over to the authorities for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, so Jesus' trial, his crucifixion, and his death were witnessed by his disciples and his followers. He was marched from judgment hall to judgment hall, and Jesus was eventually convicted and sentenced to death by hanging on a, on a cross. The Jewish leaders conspired against him. The Roman courts hoped to quash any form of uprising, and the very people that praised Jesus as he entered Jerusalem uh, just five days earlier, when the triumphal entry now demanded his death and mocked him as he laid on the cross, breathing his last breath. Jesus, after his death, was placed in a ball tomb, a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, and it appeared that the story of Jesus of Nazareth had come to a conclusion. The resurrection story reminds us that regardless of how things look and regardless of what the world wants us to believe, God has the final world excuse me, God has the final word and is the only authority in all things that happens in this world. After Jesus was placed in the tomb, Pontius Pilate, the Roman uh, governor uh, that was appointed over the Judea province, knowing the prophecy that proclaimed Jesus would rise again on the third day, he ordered the guards be placed outside the tomb and a large stone be placed in front of the entrance to prevent Jesus' disciples or followers from taking the body perpetuate the prophecy. So our lesson picks up in Matthew chapter 28. A lot of the things that I've just covered, you can read through Matthew chapter 27. You'll see the death and you'll see the arrangements made by the governor Pontius Pilate. But we pick up in chapter 28 and we'll jump right in. So Matthew chapter 28 verse 1, the text reads, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Amen. So the first part of our lesson is entitled the Sunday morning surprise. Our story begins with Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And I say the other Mary affectionately because there's some debate as to who she is. We know that there are multiple Marys. We know that it's Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, 
and this other Mary. And so we don't want to try to identify her or take away or add to anything to the account. But it's noted, it should be noted that there were multiple Marys and this specific Mary that accompanied Mary Magdalene was never uh, properly identified. So they're making their way to the tomb, these two Marys of Jesus to complete the preparation of his body. There were certain things that needed to be done after a person's death to prepare them uh, for burial or for the, for the tomb that they would be placed in. After the death of Jesus on Friday, two days prior to this, the Sabbath was quickly approaching, which starts at sundown. And there was concern that there would not be enough time to complete the preparation uh, or the necessary acts that was needed before the body would be completed. This is why the executioners attempted to break the legs of the three men that were hanging on the cross that day, Jesus and the two criminals, only to find out that Jesus, is, uh, had, Jesus had already passed, he had already given his life by the time they got to him to break his legs. That's the reason why they subsequently stabbed Christ in the side with the spear to confirm in fact, that he was dead. This also fulfilled the prophecy found in Psalm that Jesus's body would not be broken. It was a common ritual to break the knees of people that were crucified to speed up the process. What people would do is use their ankles and their knees to lift themselves up so that they could breathe because as they hung, their lungs would begin to collapse. So they would lift themselves up to get more air. And so they would break the knees to prevent the, 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 the people that were crucified from doing this so that they would die faster, most of the times by suffocation. But we know that the prophecy proclaimed that Jesus' body would not be broken. We also see in the text that when they went to attempt to break his knees, they found out he was already dead. Uh, so at sundown, after Jesus was placed in the broad tomb, the women were forced to cut their efforts short, and they made plans to complete the preparation of the body of Jesus early Sunday morning at dawn once the Sabbath had passed. This was an extremely stressful time for the followers of Jesus. His stress, arrest warrants had been issued as the Jewish elders hoped to eradicate the entire movement of Christ. In John chapter 2, it shows us that the disciples were actually locked in a room out of fear of the Jews because they thought that they would suffer the same fate that Jesus suffered. However, when we look at Mary Magdalene, her faithfulness and her commitment to Jesus, they remain unwavering and she continues to show love and dedication to the Master. Even at risk to her own life, Mary refuses to allow the circumstances that she finds herself in affect the way that she views Christ and, that, and affect her responsibility towards the work of Christ according to her faith. So often in life, difficulties cause us to question the path that we are on. In ministry and issues of faith, uh, we, we sometimes think that we've made the wrong turn or we've made the wrong choice. But in those moments, we should seek the aid of the Holy Spirit and pray for the strength, the perseverance, and the fortitude to remain faithful, even when it becomes inconvenient or uncomfortable. We are so blessed living in Western civilization and what can be considered uh, a pro-Christian, pro-evangelical uh, atmosphere where we are not questioned because of our faith, we are not arrested because of our faith, or we are not prohibited from uh, practicing and sharing our faith with others. However, there are still some places in this world today where Christians are not freely able to share the gospel and preach the gospel and just testify and worship God openly and freely in a comfortable manner. Now, if we go back 2,000 years ago, at this very moment, this Sunday morning when Jesus still laid in the tomb, uh, we can imagine the stress that the children of Israel were going through. Many of them, after seeing Jesus hanging on the cross, had de decided in their own mind that they had made the wrong choice to follow Jesus. Perhaps he was not the Messiah that had been promised so long ago, some 500 years ago, thousands of years, even before to Abraham. Uh, perhaps the disciples had chosen Rome when they decided to give up all that they had, their families, their livelihood, their inheritance, their careers, and follow this man named Jesus for the past three years. Even these women that were strongly ostracized and strongly condemned because of their actions, they were in an uncomfortable position. And most assuredly, there were some that turned their backs on Christ, thinking that he was not in fact God. And my brothers and sisters, the worst thing that we can do in our lives is allow circumstances, allow the work of the enemy to distract us from our love and our faith in and towards Christ. We must remain faithful even when it gets difficult. And to be honest, if we look back at what's happening 2,000 years ago, if we look across the nation and across the world, we are not in that bad a shape. I know that our communities are difficult to uh, 
to survive in. You don't always have the best resources and crime continues to run rampant. And then the services that are supposed to protect and provide for us sometimes fall short. But even in the midst of all of that, we are still more blessed than we could ever, ever imagine. So it was easy to follow Jesus when the crowds chanted his name. And when he performed miracle after miracle, there was an excitement and a joy surrounding his every move. They were literally rock stars and superstars traveling throughout the land. But now the crowds of worshipers were the very ones that demanded his death. His fearless and faithful disciples, rocked by the betrayal of one of their own and hunted as fugitives, were literally hiding out of fear. It is times like this that put our faith to the test. But like Job, who refused to curse God, and trusted that God, being in control, would work things out for the good of, of, of his children, meaning God's children, you must also have that same faith, trusting that whatever it is that we're going through, whatever situation we find ourselves in, God has designed it for our good. We can lift up the faith of Mary Magdalene and this other Mary as an example of how allowing difficulties to, of, of not allowing difficulties to distract us from depending, from serving, from worshiping, ultimately from following God in all situations. It's important to remember the purpose of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was written in a hope to show Jesus as the promised Messiah, the fulfillment of prophecy and the embodiment of God's promise to Abraham and Israel. It was of the utmost importance for Matthew to ensure that his words would be taken literally and that the accounts he shared would serve as proof of Jesus' Jesus's physical existence as a man. It goes a long way to cover the actions of the last remaining followers of Christ, highlighting that the story is not rumors passed down, but actually eyewitness testimony. And so it's important that we realize that this is not what the disciples heard people talk about. This is not what the rumors were, that the grave had been opened up. But it was, in fact, two women that had made their way to the grave, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that saw for their own eyes what has been recorded. And Matthew goes out his way throughout his gospel to make sure that he shares eyewitness accounts so that there could be no doubt as to the validity of his statement so that people wouldn't try to spiritualize them or mysticize them, that they were actual factual and uh, uh, events that happened and that people actually witnessed. So we see the Sunday morning surprise in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, but now we jump down to verses 2 through 4. The text reads, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the darts shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So during the journey of the tomb for these two women, there was an earthquake, and the stone that covered the entrance of the tomb was rolled away by the angel of the Lord that descended down from heaven. Now, theologians shared that this is not clear whether the earthquake caused the stone to move or if the moving of the stone caused the earthquake, but there was a great commotion that could only be attributed to divine intervention. A lot of times we get so caught up in the specific details of what happened first and what happened second. However, it's clear that this text is not meant to, uh, it's clear that this text is meant to show that there was divine intervention at the hands of God that moved the stone and that it was not man that did it. But first of all, the stone was very large and too large for just one man to move it by himself. Definitely not these two women that were making their way to the grave. Secondly, there was a guard posted outside the tomb that was there for the specific purpose of making sure that the uh, stone would not be taken or no group of men would seek to move it. And so the angel descending from heaven was God's way of making it clear that this was not man's act, but God did it in a supernatural way so that his actions, his works could not be questioned. And my brothers and sisters, we can celebrate the fact that every now and then, God does something so miraculous, so wondrous, so mystical in our lives that there's no way to explain it, but the hand of God was on us. And I can testify in my life and through the mistakes that I've made, through the places that I found myself in, through the roads and the paths that I've tried, and that every now and then I've gone a place, did something, said something I had no business doing, and I did not have it within my own capacity to fix it. And then God stepped in right at the nick of time and turned that situation around. And I believe we can all testify, regardless of how large or how small it might be, we can all identify times in our lives where it was God and only God, and we are 100% sure that no one else was able to do what God has done for us. So the stone symbolically locked in the work and the salvation that lied within Jesus alone. 
literally the salvation, uh, the, the freedom from sin was in the tomb, Jesus the person, and the stone represented uh, the world blocking our salvation. The work of the angel of the Lord that removed the stone, the work of God, highlighted that nothing man could do but they would be able to prevent God's plan of salvation for his children, for the entire world, through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. To the Jewish elders, the Romans, his followers, and even one of his own disciples had now betrayed Jesus, but nothing was able to prevent God's plan of salvation for the world, to prevent God's plan for Jesus' life. And I just want to encourage us right now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your week, your month, your year, or even your life has been like, there is nothing that man can do, nothing the enemy can do, nothing that backstabbers can do, nothing the haters can do that can prevent God's plan of salvation for your life. And all we have to do as Christians is uh, faithfully and humbly walk along the path that God has placed us on. And I promise you, everything will always work out for our good. Now, the appearance of the angel must have been quite a sight for the guard because the text said that the guards, they shook in fear and became like dead men, literally frozen to death, uh, not, not literally, excuse me, a figuratively frozen to death, unable to move and react because of what they had witnessed. But such an important task, these guards would definitely experience and must have anticipated some type of plot of recapturing the body of Jesus based on the instructions that they received from Pontius Pilate himself at the end of cha uh, Matthew chapter 27. But the power, the might, and the appearance of the angel once again reminded the guards that they were up against a power that they were no match for, the power of God. Remember, this was the second mysterious event surrounding the death of Jesus in just the past three days. While Jesus laid on the cross and gave his final breath, the Bible tells us that there was an earthquake and reports of dead people walking around out of their graves and reappearing to their loved ones throughout the city of Jerusalem circulated about. And so there was already such a powerful move of God surrounding the death of Christ. And this earthquake and the removal of the stone by the angel of the Lord was just yet another sign that God was in fully control of this situation, no matter the efforts of the Romans, the Jewish leaders, and Pontius Pilate in these guards. As we look at this account, it may seem strange to us to see angels descending, earthquakes, and dead people walking. But when we look at our own lives, can't we identify the miracles that God has done and continues to perform around us each and every day. I don't want to go into my own testimony, but I can tell you that there are some things that it was nothing but God that could have pulled me out. The Lord continues to bless us. He continues to protect us. And he continues to provi provide for us. Just in these past couple of years, in these past months, he's continued to protect us from the worst pandemic of our lifetime, the COVID pandemic. He's continued to protect us from this war and prevented the outpouring of World War III. Even in Chicago, as it's become unsafe to travel on the highway, even as I sit in one of the most dangerous communities in our nation, the Austin Lawndale community here on the west side of Chicago, God continues to protect and to, continues to bless more than what we could ever deserve. So we see the Sunday morning surprise in verse 1. We see that which only God can do in verses 2 through 4. But now we jump down through math to Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 7. The text reads, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So this portion of our lesson is entitled Words of Hope from God's Messenger in the 5th and 7th, 5th through the 7th verses of the 28th chapter of Matthew. Here we see the angel communicating directly to these two women, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, telling them to not be afraid. Again, the same uh, actions that the guards witnessed that caused them to tremble and become frozen in fear was the same actions that Mary Magdalene and Mary had uh, witnessed. And so now the, the sheer a sight of what had happened was troubling. They didn't know if this something had happened. They didn't know if this was the actions of the Roman governor, or if this was uh, something mystical. And then they quickly realized, wait a minute, this is God doing something uh, great because they saw the angel of the Lord literally sitting on top of the stone. Now, the angel of the Lord wasn't simply uh, in a nice tailored uh, suit, I guess turban or, uh, or cloth, as, as it might have looked like. The angel of the Lord wasn't simply well-groomed. He looked divine, and it was easily they were easily able to identify that he was not like them. 
And so they were also kind of stunned. They were also in shock. And then the angel of the Lord communicated them to them. When God is doing something extraordinary in our lives, we should never be afraid, but instead we should become encouraged knowing that God is still on our side and that God is still working on our behalf. We don't have to be afraid when God shows up in our life. We don't have to be afraid when the Holy Spirit takes over. I know every now and then I, 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 I consider myself more of a conservative worship, comparatively a worshiper. Comparatively speaking, you won't really find me often running up and down the aisles or jumping and leaping. And it's not that God has not been good to me. It's just that the way I react, I, I, I tend to be laid back in my reactions in most things in life. But every now and then when worship and the spirit gets high, when the Lord does something good, when I'm stick to thinking about all the things God has done in my life and in the lives of the people around me, just the spirit takes over. I get a case of the can't help. I find myself shedding tears. I find myself leaping for joy. I find myself singing songs of worship. I find myself clapping my hands, even find myself lifting my voices and shouting hallelujah. And it's because you can't help but get excited when you think about how good God is. But I must admit, the first time the Spirit took over, I was so afraid. I didn't know what was happening, almost embarrassed. And I kind of had to take a step back and realize that of all the things I get excited for, a good meal, a good sports game, uh, a good television show, uh, the least I could do is recognize how good God has done, been in my life, and God has done for all the good things God has done for me, and react accordingly, react correctly. And so I'm excited that the Holy Spirit is able to lead me into a worship that I can't control every now and then. So unlike the guards, the women who had given their lives to God could celebrate the work of the Lord, even when it was irregular and uncommon. It wasn't common for the angel of the Lord to descend from heaven. It wasn't common for earthquakes to happen. It wasn't common for the angel to sit there and talk to them. Yet, even in the midst of these uncommon activities, the women that were there still worship God and still remain faithful. My brothers and sisters, I challenge you and dare you to just look around in your own life. Think about all the times where the doctor said that nothing could be done. Think about all the times where everyone else had given up on your marriage, on your health, on your career, on your finances, on your children on your community, and yet in the still, you remain faithful. And we can testify that God continues to perform miracles day in and day out, not only in our lives, but in the lives of the people around us. So the angel tells the woman not to be afraid. Jesus, who was crucified, is not here, for he has risen, and come see the place where he lay. The angel invites the women into the tomb to be eyewitnesses so they can witness that Jesus is no longer there. Again, Matthew goes out his way to describe the eyewitness account of these women, knowing that it would serve to dispel rumors of Jesus' resurrection, that it was not just a spiritual act, but it was a physical act, a literal physical resurrection. The women, no longer in fear, are calmed by the voice of the angel of the Lord and see for themselves that Jesus' body is no longer in the tomb. The angel of the Lord further instructs the women to go and tell the disciples that Jesus had rose. He also shared that Jesus had already gone into Galilee and that they would see Jesus there. It's important to recognize the important role these two women played in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply the good news of Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection. How wonderful is it to see God choose these two women to become the first to announce the resurrection of Jesus Christ, highlighting that God can use us regardless of our title, regardless of our social status and regardless of our ethnicity or our gender. Furthermore, Jesus has, had not outgrown his humanity and transformed into some type of mystical or divine creature, but Jesus was still the same man that had walked with them for the past three years. The resurrected Christ was the very person that had ministered with and the relationship that ministered with these women and with his disciples and the relationship that he had already established would continue to uh, grow continue to be nourished even after his death and resurrection. It reminds us that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The same God that created the world is the same God that, that fed the 5,000. It's the same God that got up out the grave, and it's the same God that continues to advocate for us today and protect and provide everything that we have. So we see the Sunday morning surprise. We see that which only God can do, and we saw, we've seen words of hope from God's messenger. But now we jump down as we conclude our lesson to the 8th through the 10th verses of Matthew chapter 28. 
the Tetsuri, so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The women, after receiving instruction from the Lord, from the angel of the Lord, excuse me, quickly made their way to the disciples to deliver the good news that they were instructed to do. The haste in which they move shows us the urgency that should undermine all the work that we do for Christ. We tend to take our time with things, and we sometimes wait until the last minute to complete the work that we've been assigned. Oftentimes, if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize how much more we could have completed how much more effective we could have been if we had only started earlier or worked harder or moved a little bit faster. But the women here show us that when we are working for the Lord, when we are doing what God has commanded us to do, we should have an excitement and an energy that reflects the urgency and importance of the task that we have been charged with. Imagine how much better our lives would be if we started eating better at younger ages. If we started working out while we were still in our youth, if we began to save and invest when we were children, I am always reminded of opportunities I missed because I believe I would always have much more time at a later date. But when it comes to ministry, these past two years have taught us that nothing is promised. Tomorrow is not promised, and we should move with a sense of urgency, knowing that our brothers and sisters are literally wasting away while we're taking our time. So during the journey of these women, they're greeted by Jesus and they respond to him by falling at his feet and worshiping him. Jesus did not give a sermon or perform a miracle, but only said hello. And these women immediately begin to worship at his feet. When Jesus enters our life, when Jesus is speaking to us, we should not only be able to accurately identify his presence, but we should also be able to adequately respond to his presence. It's not just good enough that we recognize the voice of God or hear the voice of God, but it's important how we respond to the voice of God in our lives. And we see the women do two things. They responded with obedience and they responded with praise and worship. And that's really all God is asking of us, that when we are spoken to or when we receive instructions from the Lord, that we respond with obedience and we respond uh, Accordingly, uh, I'm talking about our everyday journey. As we move about about our lives, go from day to day, as our Savior continues to advocate for us and God continues to provide for us, the Holy Spirit continues to guide and direct our paths. Our prayer should be that when we're on the path that God has placed us on, we should not only be able to hear his voice, but to respond accordingly to his voice with obedience and worship. The women, again, respond with obedience to the Lord by following his instructions. Then they respond with worshiping God when he appears in their life. Jesus then again tells the woman to not be afraid and to go tell his brothers what has happened and they will see him in Galilee. Jesus gives the same instructions that the angel of the Lord gave at the tomb with one main difference. He refers to his disciples as his brothers. What a way to end the lesson, to highlight the depth of relationship between Jesus and his disciples. Those that gave their life to Christ and followed him were blessed to be welcomed into eternal fellowship with God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We too receive the same blessings even in times of fear. When we fall away from the path that God has placed us on, God continues to love us and continues to desire to cultivate a relationship with us. So let's look at these disciples. They had made the right choice to follow Christ. One of them had betrayed Christ and now they were locked in their room for fear of the Jews. Yet and still, even in the midst of their fear, even in the midst of their questions, God still loved them enough to make his way towards them and to enter into his life. And I want to fast forward a little bit. It says that Jesus appeared in their midst through the locked door. It doesn't say that he not. It says that Jesus just appeared, which means that when we go through times of pain and hurt, when we are in, in moments in our ministry where we're questioning if we're on the right path or if we should move forward, if we should stay on the path that we're on, Jesus still is reaching out for us. He still desires to have a relationship with us. And the truth is that Jesus is making his way towards each and every one of our lives. It's up to us to not allow the circumstances and the distractions of life to stand as hindrances to the relationship that we already have with Christ. I can tell you from a moment, from a perspective of honesty, 
that there have been moments where I've questioned my calling and questioned my faith. I've seen some difficult, horrible things, and I just really wondered how God could allow certain things like that to take place. And then there's also been moments when I've done some things I'm not proud of, and I thought that I might have positioned myself outside of God because of my thoughts and because of my actions. But each and every time in those dark moments, in those deep and uh, dark places, God has pulled me out and he's reached out to me. And I praise God that it was the prayers of my of my family and the prayers of the preacher and the church members. It was the uh, songs that the choir sang. It was the sermons that were preached. It was the, the scriptures that I heard that encouraged me to not stay in those dark places, but to realize that God indeed had something better in store for my life. And so no matter how many mistakes we've made, no matter how far we've drifted away, even when we are overcome with fear, God desires a relationship with each and every one of us. And we are able to trust that no matter what we go through, God is still working it out for our good. What a wonderful lesson to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how God made sure that regardless what steps were taken to prevent his plan of salvation, God's will was done. And no matter what Pontius Pilate tried to do to lock in the body of Christ, God's will was done. Even in the midst of the disciples' fear, God sent two women to both witness that Jesus had risen from the dead and proclaim the truth that Jesus had only lived and died, but also rose again from the dead. And then we know that Jesus' ministry continued for a short period before he ascended into heaven. Thank you for your time and your presence and your prayers. And it is my deepest prayer, no matter what you're going through, no matter what situation you find yourself, that you be encouraged that nothing that you do, nothing that the enemy does, nothing that man does to prevent God's plan for your life. Amen. What a wonderful lesson. Thank you for joining us. Again, it is Easter uh, morning here at Friendship Baptist Church. We encourage you to join us at 11 a.m. for our live worship service. There are so many wonderful worship opportunities taking place today. So even if it's not here at Friendship, find some place to worship God. And I guarantee you're going to hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven. For those of you all that have uh, continued to support us uh, financially during this time, we praise God for your support. There are four ways that you can give here at Friendship Baptist Church. You can give on Cash App, Dollar Sign, Friendship Chicago. You can give on the website, fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or you can always mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. Uh, please continue to support the other ministries and the other works and services that we have going on here at Friendship Baptist Church. Each Tuesday morning at seven, uh, excuse me, at eight a.m., we have a prayer call led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson. The phone number and the access code is on your screen. Each Wednesday evening at six p.m. is our live Bible class, which is uh, uh, being taught by our pastor, Dr. Backus. We're currently in the Book of Romans, and then also Sunday morning at nine thirty and eleven, our Sunday school and worship hour. If nothing else, we thank, we praise God for your presence. We praise God for your prayers. And we ask that God's will continue to richly abound in your life. Let's end with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to worship and praise your name. Father, we thank you that you saw fit to save us even before we were born. You sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And not only did he die, but he rose again from the dead with all power in his hands. The power to help us to live right, to act right, and the power to give us eternal life through his blood. So Father, help us to remember the sacrifice that you and Christ made but also help us to trust that nothing that, can, that we do, that the enemy does or man does, can ever prevent your will in the life of your children. So help us to walk in your way, to walk in your word, to walk in your love. And we pray that your love, that your protection and your provision continues to richly abound in each and every one of our lives. Thank you for our pastor, Dr. Backus. Thank you for our Sunday school superintendent. Thank you for each and every Sunday school instructor and teacher throughout this land as we continue to strive to do our best in serving you your word. It is in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful and blessed week. Happy Easter and I will see you next week if the Lord says the same. God bless.